All right, folks. Good afternoon. And thank you for coming out this afternoon because I know there's many other things you could have been doing on your Tuesday afternoon. But thank you for coming and welcome. My name is Avery Lewis, the St. Thomas Ward Island Administrator. And um, today we're hosting this town hall meeting here in Northside, Hall Bay, among all our friends and families. So before we begin, I'd just ask you to indulge me in a short prayer. So with a prayer, every, makes everything right. Thank you, God. Oh, sorry. Thank you, God, for allowing us all here today to have an open discussion. Bless us all with wisdom, knowledge, and love. Dear God, thank you for giving us traveling mercies to be here today and traveling mercies as we leave this place this evening. Thank you for giving us health and strength, and whatever we do, make sure it's in the best interest of the United States Virgin Islands. Thank you, God, for everything that you have given us and everything that we are about to receive. In your name, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, like I said, I'm Avery Lewis, your St. Thomas Ward Island Administrator. And with me here today, I have none other than our Honorable Governor, Albert Bryan Jr. And our Lieutenant Governor, Tregenza a. Roach, Esquire. And I do have some very other important guests here with me. Some cabinet members that, you know, is going to bring, some ve bring a very good message to this neighborhood this evening. I have Commissioner Desini, VIPD, Virgin Island Police Department, Mr. Ray Martinez. I have com Commissioner of Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Mr. Jean-Pierre Oriol. And I have Commissioner of Public Works, Mr. Derek Gabriel. So folks, we're going to get this show rolling. And again, I say thank you for partaking in this afternoon's discussion. I'm going to introduce first Lieutenant Governor Roach as he brings some warm remarks to us. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Avery. Uh, I'd like to first recognize my, I have two staff members here, my executive assistant, uh, Ms. Anis Canton, and the chief of staff, attorney Monica Carbon. And what they will do, we're here this afternoon to share as well as to listen, and so they will assess, assist me in taking some notes uh, of the issues that come up so that we can address them uh, accordingly because we may not be able to provide directly every answer to every question that may be asked this afternoon. Now, the, we lo I looked at the document uh, this afternoon, and I'm really happy to have such a great turnout. And it reminded me of the town, town meeting that we held in Cruz Bay. And the governor and I had spoken about having more of these kinds of meetings uh, throughout our communities. But you know, with the pandemic and the uh, restrictions against uh, mass gatherings, uh, we were curtailed in our, our attempts to do that. So it's really gr a wonderful opportunity to come out and share with the community this afternoon. I wanted to just share a, a couple of items. When we looked at the listing of issues that came up, um, the, very, the single item under the office of the Lieutenant Governor uh, without a whole lot of detail was the property tax uh, question. And so we will just share a, a gener some generic information about that. And I don't know if uh, all of you know, but there are many divisions that are under the office of the Lieutenant Governor that include uh, the passport office, the notaries, uh, of course the tax assessor, the tax collector, and a very important project that we have going on now is the Geographic Information Systems Street Addressing Initiative, which will succeed in developing an urban grid of the entire territory, uh, which provides a, 
a reliable street addressing system and uh, we feed that information to things like Google and uh, FEMA and uh, GPS. So our property tax bills, we send them out the last time in June of 2021 and they were uh, without any penalty or interest up until August of 2021. The Office of the Lieutenant Governor can, in, can implement amnesties uh, that waive the interest and penalties, and we've done that from time to time. We haven't discussed whether we'll be doing that this year. And of course, the new cycle will begin in June. People have a lot of questions about the uh, listing of delinquent property taxes that we did recently in the Avis on St. Croix and the Daily News on St. Thomas. And right away, people thought that that was a discussion about auctioning properties. And we've tried to allay the concerns of many people uh, that this was really something that we we're required to do by statute, and we were really giving people every opportunity to pay their bills, and so we got caught up for, with many people with their property taxes, and those names are being removed from that delinquency listing. But we will ultimately publish an auction listing of those that remain delinquent, uh, despite all the opportunities, the payment plans that we've entered into, et cetera. Uh, those of you who may have, and I'll say this even though it didn't come up on your questions, those of you who may have had real estate transactions, you may have noticed that we've had delays in that area. And the delays, the, the context that I'd like you to see those delays in, which are all factual because we've put out releases about this, was one, we've had a significant increase in the real estate transactions throughout the territory. So a significant increase in the real estate transactions in a pandemic, right? In a time when people have been sick, when we have closed offices because of COVID, when employees have had other medical needs and other concerns that have actually required us to curtail hours and to close. We've also had two, two cybersecurity attacks on the government during this period of time as well. And that has required us to spend time re-entering data, et cetera, et cetera, and to implement systems to create redundancies so that these, the issues that stem from those don't recur in the future. And so we, we're trying our best to catch up to facilitate the transactions, but we ask that you bear with us with those things in mind. They have particularly impacted St. Croix um, because in St. Croix, we've had issues with our passport offices, et cetera. We've had to move them into where the recorders of deeds uh, is located. And all of that has, in the effort to, to not interrupt any service, that has re resulted in delays in some. And so I just wanted to share that with you. I'm sure there are other issues that will come up, um, but I'm much more interested in also hearing your questions and concerns and to see uh, in any instance where we might be able to assist with any issues that you have. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Roach. And next up, we have the Honorable Governor Albert Bryan Jr. Good evening, everybody. So I want to tell you a story, right? Every year around this time is Super Bowl. Any football fans? I have this, I have this little party at my house every year that without fail, like, 50 people to show up to. And then the next Monday, I have to explain to all kind of people why they didn't get an invitation to my party. And I always tell them, I didn't invite the first 50 either. They just show up to my house. I said that to say, this meeting tonight is supposed to be, and I'm saying this because we're on Facebook world everywhere else, this is not a general town hall meeting. This was a meeting that we organized to discuss the ramp in Hull Bay because I, sp I had a small meeting with some Northsiders and they were concerned that we were building the ramp. I said, I will come down to the meeting, but I told them, once I come to the meeting, we're not going to discuss the ramp. We're going to discuss every other issue besides the ramp. So I just ask you to bear with us tonight the drawings of the ramp and what is supposed to happen back there. And we would like to address those questions first. I'm happy to answer any other questions, 
but that was it. That was a main reason why we come here because I came here because I know now everybody gonna say, "Oh, he went to Holbe. He didn't go to anywhere else." So we came down here, and I just happened to come because we're about to build a ramp. It's been funded for about. I'm sorry, it's been designed for about what ten years now. Ten years now, and we found the money to build it, and we we just decided to build it. And then Catherine Bryan specifically asked me, well, you need to have a discussion with the people in Northside about what you're going to do there before you do anything. So we could start there, and then I, I, I'm happy to answer any other questions. I brought my staff. We also have uh, Calvert White. He's a commissioner of housing park, uh, parks and recreation over there. And my chief of staff, and there's some other people here too. I'll, I'll point them out as we go. So I don't know how you want to do this. Anybody have any questions about the ramp? So when do we expect to start on it? I think we need to take public comment first. I mean, and that's why why we're here. We okay. we have the money funded already, so we were ready to go. You can go to yeah, yeah. well, her question, Commissioner Oriel, you could answer the question. Good reminder. See that? Is it on? Good evening, everyone. Um, so right now, we were anticipating going out to bid for the project uh, later on next month. We had anticipated that the original designer um, would have com helped us um, complete the bid package for it. Uh, unfortunately, um, earlier this month, the designer declined to be able to participate in that. And so right now, we are working actually with Public Works to finalize the bid package. Um, and we are hoping that we can actually be out to bid sometime a month from now. I'm wondering since... Thank you, Richard. I don't need it, but... <laughs> I'm wondering if you are trying to connect some of the dots while you're doing the ramp to the historical part of that to the west of it where the burial grounds were. Because the Army Corps of Engineers, I understand, has money that might be able to help you with that. So any anytime we do a development, we have to conduct a minimum of a phase one survey. Um, our office, uh, again, in DPNR, the State Historic Preservation Office, is also one of the line offices in there. Uh, and so we have inventories across the territory of where some of our more important historic and uh, Native American sites are. And so as part... And of any development, the very first thing that we have to do is clear the phase one. Um, we know that the area that we're thinking about for the parking uh, location that has been impacted before, you can see some of the crusher run that's been in there already. Um, but if we're going to go down a few inches to create uh, a nice permeable surface that won't erode away and those types of things, we know we'll have to do that as well. We're, we're not sure. Um, I, I'm not a marine contractor, but um, that's, that's something that we'll rely on the engineer's estimate to guide us to. The go Sure. The, the bidding process usually takes a th is a 30-day process to receive all of the bids. Um, and then it could take anywhere from 10 days to two weeks to fully evaluate, depending on the number of bidders uh, out there. Um, and then there's contracting that takes place. Uh, and then we get, you know, based on availability of materials, the, the contractor then states when they could actually uh, start the project. So it really will depend on the contractor selected, um, you know, what materials are available for them to be able to state that they're going to start, uh, because the last thing they want to do is start the project, not have the materials to move forward, and then stop, uh, and because those days are counting down against the contract as well. So best case scenario, nothing is, isn't going to happen before summer at least. Yeah. We go open it to general questions if you don't have any other questions. So, 
So the the ramp itself will definitely be closed, but the the beach access itself. So the if you look on the drawings, the staging area is actually off to the west. We want to make sure that the beach access, the roadway, everything is still uh, open, free, and clear for everybody to use. Um, there's only one road in, one road out to get to your homes up on the hillside here. So um, everything, the staging will be further off uh, uh, to the west there. Can you elaborate more about the parking? So... Right now, for the parking area, the, the goal of the department, anytime we're now going to improve or place any boat access uh, infrastructure, is we want to provide not only the launch, but also a place to park your vehicle and your trailer. Uh, I don't know how many of you have driven by on a Saturday in Frieden Hoy and see trailers and jeeps in the roadway because that boat launch is really improperly placed. There's no place for anybody to park once they've launched. So once two boats go out, you now have traffic backed up and swerving out of the roadway to avoid cars. So our goal is to survey about a quarter acre, uh, about you know a little over 10,000 square feet. We feel that based on the the size of the vessel that we're anticipating to be launched from here, I don't really see anybody driving any 40-foot boats down the hill and all these switchbacks, right? So we're, we're kind of focused on the 22-footer to the 30, 32, 33, maybe 34 um, for people to be bringing and launching down here. And then you put your trailer on that and everything. So we're figuring we want to be able to accommodate about 12 to 15 vehicles and trailers inside of that quarter acre, and that's, that would be sort of the design. Now, it's also important for us to minimize the amount of runoff that comes off of there. And so we're looking at a number of different permeable approaches. Um, one of the things that we thought about early on was what's happening at the Smith Bay Park using the plastic grid system with the crusher run in there. Um, that has held very well at Smith Bay but it actually has not held very well in other places. So we have to look specifically uh, at that site and see what's going to be. There's a number of alternate uh, or number of different alternatives that we can use because we need to maintain stability, but also maintain the permeability of the water to run down and not into the ocean itself. You're given a timeline of summer and you stated that the ramp will be shut down to use. If you look out into that bay, that's a lot of boats in that bay, and summer is hurricane season. So you're pretty much telling a lot of these guys here that have their boats in that bay that they got to either pull the boat out and not fish for the time frame that this ramp is being built, or leave the boat in the water and take a chance to have to rush to pull the boat out if a storm is on the way, to have to go all the way around to the other side of the island to pull a boat to bring it all the way back up north side again. Sure. A, lo a lot of the trailers I know, they're good trailers, but there are some that are not used for road use. They're not, they're not you know, maintained for that. They're maintained for pulling the boat out the ramp, putting it in a yard somewhere back here. Sure. So, and, and thank you for that question. There's two things that we're looking at. One is timing to make sure that we're at the least impactful. Uh, the second thing actually was um, not only do we have the funding that was allocated uh, from the governor and through the legislature for this, but we have some additional funds that we have been talking about, a possible temporary ramp that could be placed. Um, that would have to be fabricated. It is an option. But I think what we were going to do is plan on scheduling this properly so that we're not completely, um, we're not creating an impact, particularly during the, the, the more active portions of the storm season. Uh, because again, there's only a certain amount of places where across the territory we can actually pull the boats out. And it, it's much cheaper to pull the boat out and deal with it on land than it is for us to come and have to recover it in the water later on. I, I also want to add that, we, you know, we we had a discussion um, in St. Croix and had some in St. Thomas as well, too, about fishing on a hole. And I made some promises to 
uh, the fishermen that we would maintain and we would repair the boat ramp. So it's not only this one, it's the one in uh, Cross Lagoon uh, in St. Croix as well. And we are doing some maintenance on the one over there. What the commissioner is then telling you too is we also trying to find more boat ramps for St. Thomas. Right. We're talking to the feds about a one out in Red Hook and how we could get access to that um, so we could have more places to launch and store trailers. That conversation is ongoing. So we're looking at that too. So this was this all of this is brought about about a conversation I had with um, the local fishermen about what we could do to improve um, their quality of life and the stuff that they're doing. So if if we have suggestions that you want to tell us, we're open to that as well too. An another um, thing you need to think about the peculiarities of this area of the island is that as soon as hurricane season done, ground sea season starts. Correct. So you have very volatile seas here. You you have times where it's last minute. You you're running down after work. You're pulling your boat out of water because of ground sea building. Okay, you don't want your boat staying here in some of these ground seas that come through because you won't have a boat the next day. So it's it's a thing of a lot of times it's last minute. You run down quick, pull out your boat, you know, ground sea coming in quick. You don't know what to expect. So yeah, and and we agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, if you look at the renderings, you'll see how much armoring we're actually putting around the ramp itself, and that's due to the ground sea that comes up. Um, one of the things that we were looking at uh, last summer after the monies were allocated was whether or not we wanted to add a finger pier. And one of the determinations that came out was how much armoring on that finger pier we would have to do because of the ground sea as well. So um, we're, we're very aware of, of the ground seas in the area and what, what happens particularly in the December, January, February time frame. Hi, good evening. Um, my question is, when the grant was first put together for this ramp, um, there was talk about there being a temporary ramp in place while this ramp was being built. Is that no longer a factor? So the, the temporary ramp itself was talked about. It, we have funding that we can put towards that. And we were, we are seriously looking at it because it, it we don't want to displace or create that large of an impact while it's there. Um, it really will depend on the methodology as well from how the construction will take place. But, but we're looking at all of the factors to make, to make sure that it's a, min, a minimized amount of impact as much as possible. Um, to also touch on minimizing the impact that you do on these different ecosystems on the shoreline, to touch on what the governor said, if you just fix up the ramps that we have in place already, you don't need to go and build ramps all over the island. We have ramps in Crumb Bay, um, Smith Bay, all over the east end that just are not maintained. And if they are maintained, then we don't need to completely like gut an entire area or put in a new ramp for an area that isn't designed for it to start with. So well, okay, I want to say something on there because one of the things when, when this next door was being built, when I came to Hall Bito, um campaign, Albert and a couple other people was telling me like the fishermen don't have anywhere to put it boats anymore because now this um, parking lot is going to be utilized. So it was a couple of things there. Number one, we had this plan on the books for over 10 years. Number two, we wanted to provide some facilities so fishermen would have place to park the trailers and whatnot. And then number three, we wanted to repair the ramps. So I, I was talking to a gentleman, I, I ain't seen him now. Back then he was saying it protrudes far out into the water and there's a lot of a shielding like he was um, commenting and I just want him to answer that for you like he answered for the gentleman. Yeah, so to, to speak to the ramps, uh, again, we are maintaining them, but the other thing that we're looking at is after you launch, what do you do with your vessel, I mean your vehicle and your trailer? And so Hull Bay has a lot of opportunity because we have some land that, that, that's associated with that. Where we are in Friedenhoi, for example, there's no land associated where you could actually safely be able to park without being in the street and causing some issues. So we're looking to move the East End boat launch to a more accessible area. That's where we're having the conversations with the National Park Service and being able to go in there into Red Hook. Much, much more parking for that. Um, but particularly for this ramp, in terms of one of the design changes that we're making, it's that the the complaint has been the drop 
And uh, when we trailer and we lower the vessel into the water, the vessel, the vessel is being lowered into very shallow draft. And so the extension on this is to get that out into a little bit deeper water. And so we're going to change the incline that comes in here and make it more gradual. And it's going to go out a little bit longer. But the idea is to armor that and then safely launch in a, in a much safer depth of water closer to four feet than rather that in between two and three two and a half to three feet um, where they're particularly on the days that that you have some heavy wave action that can cause some damage uh, to your vessel lowering in so that that's one of the primary changes the design changes we're doing here but the other boat launches like you referenced those don't belong to us though yes right? no they do so we could repair those too right all right like hull bay for example uh, again we have uh we have the boat launch in hull bay and then now we have two things that have happened since we have installed those launches. The first is that our marine terminal for DPNR and Blue Lightning Enforcement is down in that Crumb Bay area. As an enforcement facility, we just simply can't leave it open to the public anymore. And so that boat launch has to be locked and maintained for VIPD, DPNR enforcement, and just more secure. On the opposite side now, Years ago, we installed the, um, the dinghy launch or the, the dinghy dock for the Water Island residents because they needed a terminus on the St. Thomas end. And unfortunately, rather than be a transient sort of docking facility, a lot of people have just left their vessels there. They leave their cars there. They junk their cars there. And so now, after somebody launches from Crumb Bay, Again, you have an issue of where do I put my vehicle and my trailer, and it's most of the times just pulled up halfway on the side of the road, and you know it's not that active, so you say, okay, patience, you can get around it with minimal disturbance, but if it was a high traffic area, all of us would agree that that's unacceptable. And so we're looking for areas where we can improve not only the launch, but safely trailering and keeping your vehicle uh, in a spot as part of that boat launch. And that's what we have to, to find the adequate areas of land to do that. Afternoon, how are you? Senator Alma Francis Heiliger. I, I just wanted to get some additional information for myself. Um, when this decision was made, what was the decision process in regards to choosing the new location and was there any type of studies done as the potential impact for reefs and coral reefs in that area? Second of all, could you tell me the total amount of the grant monies that has been sitting around for roughly about 10 years? There, there is and, no grant money. The so, legislature passed the money. This is money that we appropriated, and the legislature, we gave it to the legislature, and we included it in all of the road paving that you're seeing doing now. It was $20 million dollars but we made sure we put this and the other boat ramps in it. So, and it just got, this is awarded last year, so. Good, good. Um, the other question I wanted to ask, we spoke a little bit about the temporary um, ramp and the possibility of it may or may not happen. What are the possibilities of something like that actually coming to fruition in order to make sure that individuals are not you know, disenfranchised during this process? So, Senator, I would say uh, cost is number one, uh, length of time permitting, uh, and then the actual construction itself, like this construction schedule, will all be factors in whether or not we want to pursue that as the primary option or just actually push down the line to make sure that we get out of the season. But we are, we are going to look at, a, at, at, at minimum, we want to continue looking at some type of temporary ramp to allow access and the ingress and egress for the vessels. We, we simply don't want to shut this down for a long period of time, um, but I think that based on what the contractor will state and the methods that they're going to propose and the length of time, we'll have to make some decisions uh, during at that time with that process. So that's why Catherine asked me to come down, because there are issues, obviously, that we wouldn't think of. So we came down to hear what the people have to say about us doing it, seeing that it was a project that was done, I mean, designed, like, for 10 years, I figured we had already exhausted all of the discussion, so it was a good call to come down. Any more questions? No. 
could you follow up on the question as to the location and the decision? It didn't change. The, the okay. ramp is going back in the same spot. It's just a more secure ramp, and it's going to be longer. Right. That, that's all we're doing, uh, Senator, is we're changing the slope, and then we're lengthening it a little bit, um, but it's still going in the same footprint. Close to us, Megan's Bay is so close to Hall Bay, and when the ground seas come up, it's on either side of the very ends. There used to be a boat launch where you could, uh, the fishermen could come in on the uh, right hand side if you're facing outward, and then on the left hand side, there's really not much going on there. I don't really know what a temporary dock entails, to be honest with you, but I was going to say, as a suggestion, I mean, if it's only temporary. It seems like that would be a great place to have for in an emergency situation. You know, if there were, I don't like I said, I don't know what a, a temporary dock. No, that will be a great lift. Getting a boat launch in Megan Bay. Okay. That's that, that's <laughs> real. But yeah, thank but you for that suggestion. And we can we 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 you know we could look at some options. I mean, you know, we want to accommodate the, the fishermen and stuff. However, we can. We'll figure it out. Man, Mandal Bay is not too far. Um, there is nothing mentioned about the environmental impact that's going to happen from this dock. So the uh, so because we're doing in water work, um, I mean we're going to create a staged construction area inside, uh, minimizing anything taking place outside of that. So it'll be a controlled environment. There will be some elevated turbidity while we cut the old dock out of the way and we come in and we backfill. But again, it's, it's like any other marine construction project where you have to contain that impact inside of your containment area. Uh, this has been reviewed, studied, environmental assessments already conducted. The Corps of Engineers just issued their permit to us as well last year, uh, and it's valid for another three years. So um, we've done all of the environmental studies, and I just want to remind that the environmental studies are done by and reviews are done by this department. Okay, well, looking at the map, Extending a dock that high is going to change water flow coming through the beach. On a west swell, the water travels a certain way. On an east swell, the water travels the other way. I see the sand getting stuck in one corner and the other side going into a pond. So there needs to be water flow. It can't be just a dock straight out. That's going to end up like Mandal, and there's going to be half a beach left, and the rest is going to be rock. Okay. I uh, can... Um pull up the, f so right now that's just the two-dimensional plan. You don't have the cross section on there. Uh, we can provide you with those and, and you can take a look. And if you see something that you think will be impactful, we'll welcome those comments. Okay, other questions? It looks like we exhausted that question. So we have more? Good night. Good night. Um, on what he was saying, right, the ram before had water used to pass on an eat. The sand on both sides of the beach has absolutely changed since the new addition to the ramp that you guys put in. And I would like to ask how you said you're extending the ramp a little bit. What's a little bit? And the parking for the trailers, you're elaborating that the trailer is going to be parking. Is it you're going to put signs up for trailer parking or is it going to be parking open up to the whole beach? It's going to be public parking. I mean, I don't think they, that... You, we're going to create a significant amount of spaces. I don't know if you're f familiar with uh, Altoona Lagoon on, on St. Croix, but that would be a good example of where there is an active boat launch, but there's also some other beachside coastal resources, park space, everything that people come to enjoy. And that space is a little over a quarter acre as well and that, uh, in terms of that parking. So our goal is to create ample parking space for multiple users, including the launching of vessels. But when you came along, you push in that it's for the trailers and the trucks to park. Well, well it's the, it's now the it's main thing. It, it, the, the, uh, again, the idea okay. is so that it doesn't take up, you know, one okay. trailer could take up two or three parking spaces. Huh? Okay. <laughs> we're trying to... Just for the restaurant? So we're, we're we, trying to we. increase the parking area. For, for yeah. It's for the public. For 
It's a public parking space. It is a public parking space, yeah. You know, no good deed goes unpunished. But the, the, the reason for this project is because we spoke to the fishermen. And we make it, we put, we built in the parking because when I came down here, they told me it was taken away with the construction that was going on and people needed some place to park. So that's why we're doing it. What we don't want, though, is to have a wide open parking lot where anybody parking. If, on the weekend, of course, are people going to park there, but it's primarily for the fishermen because Monday morning, Sunday morning, and when you guys going fishing, there ain't going to be nobody in the parking lot. So once those trailers go there, they're good to go. So, you know. Hello. Hello. So to finish the thought, we currently have some issues with parking. Um, right, that we never had before. When I was a little girl growing up, the parking for this establishment was here. Where's the parking for this establishment? Stop primarily outside yes. uh -huh. on the beach. Yeah. Exactly. What, what are you trying to fix well, now? But the government ain't in charge of this. So what, this what is the purpose the, of this project? Is the, it for this establishment or is it for us? The, the purpose of the... the hey, look at, I really want to be, and I, I heard this, you know, the buzz about this. This... This has been in design for 10 years. There was never enough money to, to do it. The people asked me to do it, and I went, I found the money, I went to the legislature, we appropriated the money to do it for the fishermen. When we did it, you know, I didn't even know, now Lee Steiner owned this property at the time, he didn't when I, when I was talking to people. So, you know, the rumor mill is always a rumor mill, but we do this for the people. If, if other people use it, you know, whether they come into the restaurant, we can't control that. We just try and make it better. Right now, it ain't good at all. People parking in the road. We're happy with what's there. Good evening. Um, I'd like to know when the rezoning went in for this property here, for the condos. When was the zoning, when was it done? Because as far as I know, this property is grandfathered in. This restaurant and this property, not over there. So now, after all these years, all of a sudden there's an interest here as to what is going on in Hall Bay. Oh, now, now you're interested in, in the ramp that's been broken for 40 years? Really? I want to underst understand something here. Well, I know it's the election year coming up, but the North Side has been completely ignored. Ma'am, if you, and I, I respect how you feel, but you know what? The taxes haven't been paid for years. We, for years, we, we owe WAPA. You know, government uh, uh, bills haven't been paid for years. You know, we paying them. We doing the things that we always wanted to do for the first time in a long time. We have the resources to complete projects that have been on the books. All the things that we only talked about, we can now do. It's not a conspiracy. Um, and we come in to talk to the people to find out how to do it in a way that is better for our people. That's why we're here. I, I don't know about a restaurant or, or why it is here. I just picked this place because it's convenient. It's in Hall Bay, and we wanted to talk to the people. There's no conspiracy. I mean, if you look, waterfront finished, Main Street finished, the roads them getting paved, you know, slowly but slowly, surely, we're getting traction and getting the Virgin Islands to where it needs to be, and we want you to be a part of that. And that's why we come to the people before we do anything else. We're doing this one. We're doing... The one in Altoona, we're doing the one in Cross Lagoon in St. Croix. We're building back the Gallows Bay Pier. We're building back the, the, the um, King's Alley Pier. We're doing the whole Frederickstead waterfront. We're doing Veterans Drive Phase 2. We're doing $23 million on the tropical cargo dock. We're just going. And we just want the place to get back to where we could be proud of our Virgin Islands. They have nothing to do with anybody and their business. It's this are the people. You never elaborated on how long or how much longer this ramp is going to be. Because what you're planning is going to change this beach forever. So the, uh, again, so when the department put this out, we hired coastal engineers to do all of this, right? This isn't the Department of Planning and Natural Resources, the biologists inside, that actually did this. These are coastal engineers that went out and designed, looked at the water flow. From where? From the, the ex engineers? From St. Croix. So they're from here, yes, they are. The extension of the dock 
from where it is right now, where it ends, is going to extend approximately 27 feet longer to get into one foot more depth of water. So that will not actually be on top of the water. It will be in the water going out. So the water is going to actually pass over the top of the ramp for a significant amount of that end portion. But again, we have the cross-section drawings. This is like coastal engineers have looked at this. They were here on f doing field studies, everything like that 12 years ago. And what we're now doing is finally pushing forward this project now that we have the funding to do so. So I just, for, just for me, like, what are you asking for us to just pull back the ramp the way it is and leave the rest of it alone? As you said, it wasn't repaired for 40 years. We try and repair it so it could be good for another 40 years. I don't know when we're going to have money again, but we have money now to do this. So we just want to make sure it's there. We'll go back and, and talk to the coastal, um, whatever the contractor is that did the studies to understand if they know what you're talking about, because another gentleman mentioned it to me with the sand and the stone switch inside of the bay and what the impact is going to be. That's a genuine concern. Um, good evening. My, I think the concern that we're hearing, every business that you open, one of the requirements is parking. And that is the standard here. This has developed. We understand it was here before. Where is the parking for the new construction that they have actually put in place here? I don't that, know if you can address that, yeah. but... That's a different question. I, I don't know when the permitting took place. I don't know okay. if the commissioner... So, again, those locations there, I mean, again, they're still single family. So, whatever somebody might think they might be, they're still single family. And the parking for those structures is on those parcels. And it's zoned R2 for them. It's on which spot? For each, there's, you know, there is not... There is not just one single parcel here. There are multiple small R2 zone parcels. Okay. We're not dealing with the restaurant because, like you said, the restaurant itself is grandfathered in, right? So minor improvements, those types of things, this place is grandfathered in. But when you build a home, right, you're, it's not, you're, you're not building one parking space for every room that's inside of it. Okay, but it's so not a home. This if is it's, a, it's this a, is a business. So, so uh, again, one of the, so. Okay, but wait a minute. You're, you're not answering, you're not really answering the question. I, We're saying to you that this is a business. And as a business, if I open a business, I need parking mm -hmm. for my, don't tell me I, that I can park on the road. I don't want to, I don't want to, to go too deep on, our, I, we didn't come down here to, debate the, the zoning, but I'll ask you this, you know, I'm born in Savannah, I live in St. Croix, right? I, I've come back and forth to St. Thomas. Almost every single house in St. Thomas have two or three apartments, and everybody parks on the road. And there's, and, there, and right now, everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, there's a lot of people who run in Airbnbs out of their house. Those are businesses as well, too. I'm holding back DLCA right now because we got to have a serious conversation about whether these places, residential neighborhoods, are zoned for businesses and whether these businesses, Airbnb apartments, need individual hotel licenses in order to operate because they're accommodating guests that are coming from other places who are having weddings and having other types of activities in their house. So that's a discussion that we are having. And, you know, there, there are people who are going to be very offended when we tell, start to tell people, you can't have an Airbnb in your house. You can have a rental, but it must be long-term. It can be short-term. And every one of those things are going to have a business license. So I think that's a community conversation that we have to have about doing that because you can't do it for one person. It has to be for everybody. So the laws have to apply E equally, because we're getting a lot of complaints now in residential neighborhoods where people rent out their house on Airbnb. Every week there's a different party going on in the house, and the neighbors are disturbed. The other part about it is is squeezing our people out of homes. They can't find places to rent. So we could have that discussion as well, too. But 
as far as the zoning and what's going on there, there's right, right now there's no restriction from you renting out your one your your single family dwelling or your, or your duplex. There's there's no real guidance there that's enforced anyway about doing that. So we look into it. I, I, like I said, DLCA, uh, property and procurement, not property and procurement, DPNR is having that discussion now. They were just about to make everybody get a license. I said, let's wait and get some real rules and regulations because that's just going to really irritate a lot of people. We, we need to figure out an approach that makes sense. Other questions? Yes. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I don't want to change the topic, but my concern is the neighborhood streets or roads. As you know, most of us in, live on a neighborhood street with a lot of potholes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know I thought I heard you had a proposal as to how we could get those things fixed. In fact, the private roads. So I no, came no, no. here to I, get some no, more no, details no, no. on that. I, I would like to stop you when your people sure. say, we're fixing the government roads. We have 700 miles of them. Commissioner Gabriel is here, and he could address some of that for you. So are there any plans for the private roads then? You want, okay. Honestly, I'm, the only plan that I had, I, and, and I would like to get it to the legislature, I gave it to a couple senators, and no one is moving it. The government cannot afford to maintain the 700 miles of road they have now. So we don't want to take on any more roads that we can't maintain. Private roads have private homeowners. My proposal was that we pass a piece of legislation that says we'll pave the road, but everybody who owns parcels along that road would have to pay a premium on their land tax. That money would go into an, a fund labeled for that road. So when it needs to be repaired, we could tap that fund to pave the road. And I think that's a fair a, a way to do it because – if the government starts paving all these roads, we're not going to be able to pave the main roads. We could barely keep up now. And that's just the reality of it. We don't have the money to maintain all these roads. We're scraping and scrimping to do the road paving you're seeing. The federal highway money, we're going to be able to do some uh, extra paving. We're going to be able to do the FEMA road paving. But then we have to maintain all of this um, annually. It's a million dollars a mile to repair roads. So. Oh, no. Yeah, and and the price. Well, I like commissioner. Um, <laughs> let you know what going. Um, if if they're done, because the reason why is because um, all of us have cars and we would like our roads better. Now, my second question has to do with we, street. We, we street, do let him. Like, no, it's before okay. you go, I, before I you answer the question, let me. no, it's okay, Governor. I got your answer. I, I'm not interested in the public roads. It's okay. Um, in regard, my second question has to do with the neighborhood lightings. Um, I remember years ago, um, WAPA made an effort to add more lights on the streets and neighborhoods. And I'm seeing now they're lessening the lights. For example, in our area, we have very few street lights, most of which have not been repaired since the hurricane. So you came here to get details on those issues. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. My name is Derek Gabriel. I am the Commissioner of Public Works. While I do not work for WAPA, I do feel comfortable speaking for them in this regard. Um, we've been meeting with WAPA several times since the storms, um, and we've been trying to really get as many street lights up and running as possible. So from the department's perspective, we try to make sure in our current projects, we're including street lights. So of course, any of our federal projects, especially on St. Croix, we included um, several street lights. I know you know that number. <laughs> Over 300 street lights on um, the Melvin Evans Highway. Of course, here in St. Thomas on Veterans Drive, we made sure to light it up. We just came through on waterfront making repairs and actually replacing some of the um the heads now to the previous person's question we are trying to we are making it into the neighborhoods we are replacing some of them we're still going through some of the fema processes to make sure that we're getting the funds and that those lights are being replaced properly so that we could get reimbursed it does take a little while it is taking longer than we would expect but again to the to our point earlier we are trying to replace them with some of these neighborhood projects as well Especially in St. Croix, we've been able to pave or we've been able to issue task orders for everyone. Here in St. Thomas, we're moving. We do have, um, upcoming in March, we're going to be finishing the portion of the road Lorcan Lawn and Miss Goons over by um, the Drake Seat area. We just finished a major retaining, pro a retaining wall project on the Hall Bay Road, including some drainage improvements. We do have another um, pavement project that we're going to be doing on Suicide Hill which also includes um, uh, drainage improvements. And we have more stuff coming in Estate Hope, Estate Pearl, further out west. 
coming in late March and early April. So we are addressing the neighborhoods. That's been our push. And you will see a, um, a significant push in both St. Thomas and St. John in the coming months. Thank you for your question. He's just talking about the north side projects. There are other we, correct. We, and, and one thing I, you know, I, I, I always have to tell the public in terms of our, our projects, right? You know, any governor would have been happy to have five capital projects. Would have been ecstatic to have ten. I have two hundred and seventy-five, and I, I'll tell you, if you have people that you know to to work, we need them to work because it is simply impossible to move any faster. The contractors don't have enough people to work in our government offices. We're getting stuck because we don't have the procurement experience, the engineering, the construction management experience. If you got people to work, send them because we need them. Because we the, last year in capital improvement projects, we did $723 million we spent last year. And this year we're gonna spend at least five, 600 million. We are already up to 300 million in contracts. This is only, this is the second quarter. We in, in the second? Yeah, second, second quarter of the fiscal year. Right. So we still have two, two more quarters to go and this one to end in March. The amount of work that's coming through all the time is incredible. So we need people, we need help um, to get some of this stuff through. Richard, before you move on, does anybody live in North Star Village? So I know this one is going to be popular. I actually save this one for last. We do. We are expecting to do the the road, the North Star Village Road, starting in April. So it's pretty significant. We did some pre-construction work today. I did save that one for last. So that's a pretty positive plus. No, you can ask another question. I don't give the big one. No, I, I just can't. <laughs> Brass view, that brass view area. Okay. Yeah, we we were we are planning to address that as well. We have a FEMA project for that area, which will not only do the pavement but also the drainage as well. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, so my question is regarding the recently um uh, agreement with the Open Ship Registry. So um. So, you, when, from my understanding, when a ship uses open registry, right, um, the ship is, is not required to have crew members from here for, or from the country which is registered. They are also not required to set anchor in the country which is registered. They have uh, little to no um, uh, restrict, vessel restrictions. And it seems like the tax environment is more favorable, favorable to them, which sees them paying little to no taxes, right? So it seems like most of uh, the conditions with that is uh, favoring the ship more than the country. So my question is, um, besides the registration fee um, that will be received from the open registry um, that in the USVI, how else do you see will it generate um, revenue for the Virgin Islands? Excellent question. So the open ship registry is a project that, run, that we... Um, got involved with, with Northeast Maritime. In, the, in America, less than one half of 1% of the ships are actually registered US. What that means is in a time of a war or anything else, is the American, America don't have any ships to carry its cargo. The Jones Act has been in, in service so long now that there are like there are only like three American shipbuilders and Americans don't participate in the maritime industry. So it is, this is being headed by Eric DeWiki and he came to us and says we're exempt from the, from the Jones Act maritime law. We could create a, a, a ship registry here that would allow for a foreign ship. So just to tell you about the Jones Act, a foreign ship cannot sail from an American port to an American port. So because of that, it creates a situation where only American ships can do that. But we've been doing it so long that there are hardly any more American ships. It's very profitable for the people in the business, but America is hurting because we don't have ships to deliver. If the Virgin Islands was to be granted this exemption and it would have to go through Congress, foreign ships would be able to have a registry here. Part of that is building out already um, cargo industry. Um, what we have been doing over the last couple of years is really investing in our mar marine. We got a $23 million grant 
to fix all the cargo, um, the bunkers at uh, Crown Bay. We also are into a deal with uh, the Port Authority where we're going to clear that cricket field. And, you know, now they're storing more marine cargo there. Of the $52 billion in cargo that leave Florida for the Caribbean, $24 billion come through St. Thomas and St. Croix. And we plan to expand upon that. The whole of St. Croix's west end, uh, sorry, south shore, from the refinery all the way down to the airport is now a free trade economic zone. There's over $60 million of investment that's needed there to fix the gantry crane, the dock, and everything. This is the kind of move that will get us the investment and start to get Virgin Islanders more involved in the ship registry. The, the registration itself, the young man is correct. The boats don't have to come here, but we get the tax. We get the money um, from the registry and that registration every year. We have a whole uh, ship inspection a piece that we're trying to develop on the abandoned, well, it's not abandoned, it's the old aluminum plant, but there's a nice port in there. It's totally underutilized. It's only used by Crujan and Diageo. So we're trying to expand that as well. So St. Thomas has some uh, unique advantages. And I like to temper people's exp expectations. It'll take us a while before we actually establish the registry. But we started the conversation. As you can see, it's gaining a lot of attention. I didn't think anybody would notice um, down here, but it's gaining a lot of intentions, attention. So thank you for that, sir. Oh, oh, good, uh, good afternoon. I'm sorry, I'm elderly, so have a little patience with me. My problem is the water. Whenever it rains, from the, the water, all the water from WGOD comes down. There are all houses on both sides of the road. And it comes down and it goes into the um where my house is actually down in the Dorothy just and the, the water comes down on both sides and it has no proper drainage and it comes right in my house, it pulls the rocks down. This is why we have all these mudslides and everything. And uh, 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 I'm, uh, I'm tired. My mother's house is broken in four places already with this water, with everything coming up. If we could have a proper drainage, that it could, the water could go one section from where it's coming from, and a, a culvert or something or the other way, it wouldn't interfere with people's homes. I'm sure I'm not the only person in the area that suffers with that. I'm sure. Thank you. you. Thank you again. Good evening. Thank you for that. Um, we have been through a series of projects we've done, I think we've completed two on the north side where we've been improving the drainage and we're trying to, and we're making our way down into the heart of the watershed. Um, I think as we not only improve but expand, it should take care of some of the, um, the personal drainage issues that we're seeing as a result of upstream development, if that makes sense. Um, it is something I know even through um, the American Rescue Plan Act, um, we have a significant chunk of money to fix the drainage systems in the historic areas and the surrounding areas. So I think for the first time in a long time, the department is comprehensively looking at fixing drainage issues, especially in this district where we have a significant amount of them. Um, this gentleman coming up. <laughs> this is the man here. Yeah, he really, he's the gentleman that's really spearheading our, um, our drainage um, project, if you will. So I will say, like I said, through several projects on almost every major road project that we have, we're improving and repairing the drainage in the area. No, I just, I just want to say good evening. My name is Jomo McLean. And um, I'll, I'll reach out to her and get her address, and then we could look in more specifically on, on where her issue is um, so we can address some of the drainage issues. So Jomo is our head engineer. He's responsible for all the stuff you see going on. I mean, Derek is the boss, but that's the guy who to make it happen. So I uh, y'all get Jomo a hand, man. He really yeah, he deserves one. it, man. He, Please. Saint, and he's all over Saint Thomas, Saint Croix. Sorry. I telling everybody who he is, so they go stop calling me for road thing, and they go call <laughs> Jomo. That, that, that's perfect. He was just the man I wanted to talk to about the next thing. <laughs> no. Um, down here, you know, I live very close to the bottom here, and I actually have seen public works come, got the back hose down, pulling some of the loose rock around the culverts that are going under the various roads coming down here. But you know, most of this was built 40, 50 years ago, mm -hmm. the culverts underneath Hull Bay Road. And over the years, they filled up with rocks, they filled up with debris. I mean, it's good to get a backhoe on the end, but it's got the whole width of the road is full of stones. 
So those guys are working, and when the road projects come, you see them pulling them up. But right now our problem is we still got the overflow, and just because everybody has built, everybody can talk about this, that. You can look up here and see twice as many houses as you did 30 years ago, easy, and just it's just not trees anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a continuous problem, the ramp, and I, I thank you all for taking my flyer on this uh, that I put out to DPW. Thank you, and he's the man for that stuff is we've got a water flow coming down. There's one recently built catchment over there, but we had a foot of mud in this road lining up to go down that ramp after Irma, and after Maria blew through, that foot of mud was cleaned right up, right out into that water. So I think long-term, very similar to what it was achieved in Belongo, we need to try and achieve here to get some sort of catchment back here to at least slow the water coming down, even the natural guts. If we got everything flowing back there, we need to look long-term for the preservation of the water quality for this whole thing. We can all talk about two park, you know, well, who's got a parking spot, but if we don't keep mud out of here, where are we going to swim? Where are we going to fish? What do we got to do here? So I really appreciate you all looking to that in a long-term thing, even if it does take another 10 years. Right. <laughs> So I'll just say briefly, um, both Commissioner Oriol and myself, um, our teams have been really collaborating on um, the watershed initiatives that we've been pushing. I think for the first time, what Irma and Maria taught us is that, you know, there, when 100-year storms, storms blow in, it's some serious inundation with water. Um, the good thing is we have the information. We've been collaborating. Um, to your point, as the developments come, a lot of them don't um, necessarily follow the proper drainage that you need to, to, to take care of the water that they're displacing. Um, we have been looking at that. It is a really comprehensive approach. I would say, I mean, it's going to take some time, but every major project that we have, we're looking at um, including drainage infrastructure to address those problems. And to your point, the Belongo project is a really perfect example of what we can both do when we have the information and we have um, corporate partners, corporate citizens that want to participate like the Belongo Bay Resort. And just to put it, in perspective, because it bothered me too. Uh, one of the things that came up when with the the runoff and all of our bees, um, what we've been working on for like, I want to say twenty years is Savan Gut, and that's an eighty-five million dollar project. I think we're gonna get that approved by Army Corps. We're supposed to be doing a design now. We started yeah. then to do that, and then we have Torpentine Run that's out by NADA, because all of that stuff going in the mangrove there, that's a $30 million project. Those are both Army Corps projects, but the one out here we're going to have to address as well too, because there's, there's a lot of significant runoff. I don't know, Jim. So uh, just to piggyback on what Commissioner Gabriel was mentioning, um, so right now, actually starting tonight, uh, the department is actually hosting a series of public hearings. Um, so we have a big territorial watershed management initiative that has been going on for about one year now. Uh, and the, the final products of those major watersheds is actually being revealed for the public. We've held a number of stakeholder meetings, but now we're actually putting out um, the pre-final plans for everybody's um, information. So the next round of what DPNR is actually looking at is, in fact, this watershed over here. Um, we could not, we were limited in the, in the scope as to what we could do previously, um, but we have, in fact, worked with HMGP to find additional funding to be doing exactly what we did in those other projects, which is create the watershed management plans, get some concept designs that we can provide to public works, and then now the engineering can take place, whether it's retention, whether it's infiltration, but making sure that it's just not taking water and pushing it onto the roadway and bombarding the system with that. We're looking at all of those alternatives that actually put the water back into the green space so that now our roads aren't compromised as much, there's less flooding impacts and such. Um, and, and so this, this watershed here is now in the next round of what DPNR is pursuing. And we got, we got, um, we got some money to do storm water and uh, clean water work so we could put some of that money to do it because that'll really annoy me when the baton's brown. Um, fixing that is a real priority for me. 
Okay, good evening, and uh, thank you to the governor and his team for all of the good work that is being done all over the island. But I have two questions. The first one was touched on a bit, but I still want to get a little more definitive time frame as to when the roads in the bond resolution area would really receive some work. I know we mentioned 404 coming down Suicide Hill, but what about when you get to the end, you make a right and you come down towards Hull Bay on that portion of the 404, or when you make a right and you go towards the wastewater treatment plant. I've been beating the drum for this area Anytime I hear that the commissioner is on a talk show, I call in, I send letters with pictures. You know, it's really horrible. I've lived in this area for 30 years, and there's been no paving in that specific area where I'm referring to uh, around the wastewater treatment plant and towards the bridge. There's even an area on the bridge that is collapsing. Right. The, the roadsides, they don't get cut. They're, you know, derelict vehicles packed in the bushes. And, you know, this is a very, very good neighborhood. You know, citizens that really take pride in the properties. But the surrounding really, you know, is a bit depressing. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. I did recognize the voice. So I do appreciate you always calling in with that. <laughs> I pay attention. <laughs> um. So as far as that definitive timeline, I will say I am probably just as frustrated as each and every one of you with the FEMA process. Um, not only is it that we go through this to get the approval to spend the funding, but then you go through environmental reviews, you go through several different types of reviews, and it really is frustrating. Um, but what I will say is the benefit of it is once you go through all this is just um, you get a large chunk of money to address these areas that have not been touched, to your point, for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, in that case, in the case of your specific project, it is a very comprehensive project that not, not only addresses the road, but also the drainage. And that's what I keep saying because that's the most significant portion of it. Um, as you know, all our water, a lot of the water from this particular watershed drains off and flows in that area. And when you come off, you, I learned a word I like to use, or a phrase, sheet flow, which picks up chunks of the asphalt, asphalt and just takes it away. So we're not only trying to just fix the road, but really improve the drainage so that, that water is able to be displaced and you could keep the road in place for years to come. Now, to answer your question about the low-hanging fruit with the grass cutting, um, we will address that. Um, we've been working our way out, and the, well, the cars, see my guy ready, boy, my man of business, so I gonna make sure he come down with me. Um, Administrator Avery Lewis, but um, we will address the grass cutting. Um, we've been working a lot in the town area as we are trying to get ready for our tours that are arriving. Um, so you're going to see us now start to move back out on, um, into the peripheries. So give me, give me a couple weeks. I want to make sure the grass gets cut, okay? okay. You can hold me to it. Okay. But as far as the FEMA project, I would say, because it does take significant design, at least give us till probably early 2023. I know. It, takes, remember, like, it takes six to eight months to design. But that ain't the problem with every mill road. the road, take off that asphalt so at least we could drive without... Shaking our organs. I got you. So you see the gentleman that was standing to my left? He's way more intelligent than me. If he tells me that we, I go ask him to take a look at it and we will do what we can to get it done, okay? Just, just for the record, right? Uh -huh. Y'all know that's my aunt, right? And she didn't call me. She, she called the radio. <laughs> you see how the She's using the system. So we can take care of you. All right. All right. And my other, yeah, I have two questions. My other question is a little more personal to my immediate area, the wastewater treatment plant. Now I know you can't move it, but maybe you can, but I don't think you plan to move it. And I know Mr. Merritt isn't here, but there, there was mention that, was, that there was a large sum of money that was made available for repairing and even moving wastewater treatment plants. I heard about one in St. Croix that's being moved. But I'm simply asking about you know, some type of covering. I know you may say you can't cover a wastewater treatment plant, but you really can. Um, there, I did some research and I saw in many areas where there are certain types of covers that can be um, more opened and closed. There are some that may just stand as uh, like a fence 
and you know obscure the view from the public because I can see directly into it, so as you know, neighbors close to me. And also when uh, tourists pass by, you know, that's a very um, nice area for a scenic look at the in and out of brass. And many times they would pull up right there to take pictures, but you know, that's what they will see first. And I know that the project has had a lot of improvement and I must give kudos to the management because the workers are there diligently. I can set my clock to when they are gonna be there, you know, maintaining. But, you know, there's something that can be done to obscure the view from Yeah, us. We, we, um, we, we settled with FEMA. They, they awarded 1.5 billion for St. Croix sewer system. So St. Thomas ain't, ain't settled yet. We have to settle that one. It probably come around the same thing. We could address um, things like that. But I, I'll point it out to Roger. And uh, we do have some money for sewer as well, too. <laughs> and yes, I hear you about the old kind of bush. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to shift the topic back to the parking lot. My concern is that this project, the parking lot, is only a stepping stone to projects to come in the future. I don't want to have to park in the parking lot and not be able to drive up to my beach. And I don't want this to become a club where it's only some people are allowed, because I already don't feel comfortable where I am when I come here now. So I just hope in the future you guys don't use this project for stepping stones. Well, it take us 10 years just to get the money to do the little thing what we're doing now. So, I mean, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I, you know, it's becoming, you know, I noticed it. In St. Croix, it's hard to do projects on the water. It's hard to do projects. But I noticed in St. Thomas, when we were doing the dredging project in 2008, and we were talking about where to put it, that it's, it's becoming more and harder and harder to do projects in St. Thomas because people are becoming environmentally conscious and our coastlines are becoming more and more endangered. So I'm with you there. I don't know if y'all know Commissioner J.P. Oriel, but he is very, very regulatory and restrictive in terms of what he lets goes on in this Virgin Islands. And I put him there because he is like that. Me and him fight all the time because he to take the regulations to the extreme. So if you're worrying about development, it's going to be done right under that gentleman there, and he don't make any excuses about it. So I appreciate your concern, and we want to keep our beaches the way they are, and and be able to our residents will always be able to get to them. This gentleman here had a question. Uh -huh. well, I'm for the top of uh, mountain top, right? Come down Barrett Hill, all the way down. They have three culvert long time ago for your, your father and everybody were walking. But the culvert is so small. I wonder if you'll put some big one inside. I, I, I don't know what the drainage plan is, but the, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the amount of construction in St. Thomas in the last 30 years is astronomical. I shouldn't even say in St. Thomas, because St. John and St. Croix is the same. A lot of construction, and like the lieutenant governor was mentioned, our real estate is through the roof now. We don't have any more stock to sell. Um, things have been going so well, so. And more house building. So ju just to answer your question, you're right. Um, I know a lot of the drainage, especially in this area, was installed before pre um, the significant development. So our plan, like I said, is to make a comprehensive approach, and as we're um, redeveloping all of these roads, to widen and uh, expand the drainage so they could take in all the extra water. I, I, and I, I really, every time I speak, I really want to say two things that, you know, because as governor of the Virgin Islands, I am super, I get super frustrated with how projects are done, right? We could go out now and we could mill all the roads and pave them. But we're gonna have to dig them up to put up the sewer. We're gonna have to dig them up to put on the water. We're gonna have to dig them up again to put on the underwater, underground electrical and dig them up again for the fiber. We have a team that meets weekly, bi-weekly, that's talking and planning how we can put down the sewer, the water, the fiber, and the underground power in a way so that we can only dig once and coordinate all those projects and get them done. So a lot of the places where you see us not paving is because we got dig work to do there. What, what our strategy is now is to pave neighborhoods. So what 
where all these neighborhoods, Hall Bay, Contan, Hidden Valley, Miss Guns, Mandal, uh, St. Croix, all over the place. We're just doing all of those places where we know we can't dig. But every place else is very complicated, and it's not only digging. You have to design it so it drains right. Otherwise, two years in, potholes again. And we're going all the way down to the substrate. We've been fighting with FEMA because they didn't want to pay for the work all the way down to the substrate. They wanted to just repair patches of road where they could see that the rain damage and the truck damage was. And we say, no, we want the whole thing replaced. So we've won some of those battles. We've lost some of those battles. So that's why the road paving and some of the places on the main road is taking longer. Now, that's mostly in St. Croix, more so than here, because in St. Thomas, a lot of the road paving is actually getting done. A lot of the, um, what is it called, federal highway lands, uh, eastern federal lands, their projects are moving along. All up Shibuya, all them places, we already replaced all of those um, drop-off roads. But now, it's the bury and, and um, pave. Um, this is more of a question I want to know about if certain laws are in place. Mm -hmm. um, this whole watershed area, one of the major drainage areas, is right back here. A couple hundred feet that way. It used to be a mangrove. Mangrove and buttonwood. Mm -hmm. And coconut trees. I have known that to be a mangrove my whole life. We used to go in there and catch land crabs when I was a kid. It's a swamp. It's a drainage area. It's a filter for the bay, for the water that comes down the hill. Right. I go snorkeling in Hall Bay almost every week. Right. Lately, it is the whole area is covered in silt. The reason is... The water is not being filtered after hurricanes Marilyn and or after hurricanes Irma and Maria. A lot of the buttonwoods and the mangroves and the coconut trees got damaged. Right. That was an opening for them to bring heavy machinery in here, much to the dismay of everyone in this whole area, and dig out. A lot of that stuff was still living, but they took the opportunity to clear the area. Who's they? The government? The owners of the property. Uh -huh. They brought in heavy machinery. I don't know if it was permitted or not. If it was permitted, that should have never been permitted. Because that's a sensitive area. That's, that's a mangrove. And I know the law dictates that mangroves are not to be touched no. without proper permitting. Is there any line place? that mandates that that area be restored to the former wetlands that it was, that, that it is supposed to be. Because that's an extremely important area for all the water that drains from this when, whole hill. When did that happen? 2018, 19, and 20, Governor. So I'll start by saying, yes, the work was permitted. It was permitted because there, the delineation was actually done. The, the wetlands were actually outlined for where it was. The yes, the Department of Planning and Natural Resources issued a permit for the work. Huh? So, so again, you know, I think that because there have been a number of opportunities for the community to come and review the plans that were there in the office when they were under review. Yes, there are there, there I'm yes there are wetland species inside of there. There was also the public wait let, um, sir sir let's 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 so let I, anybody one second Jay. Mm -hmm. let's let's we are here to discuss this right we all know DPNR doesn't permit anything in the CZM zone without extensive hearings, public review, and no, no, commentary. No, no. So only, those are only on the ma major project. It's a minor project. So, so who built the drainage? Huh? Um, no, we did some improvements to it. So, again, to understand the process.
Yeah, we know they used to be behind this fence. So, so he doesn't want a boat park? In, well, I mean, so, so, okay. So we'll discuss the mangroves. Again, the department required a delineation and a survey of the area to show where exactly the mangroves were, the wetland area is, and also what the other species were. So what this is functioning as behind there is still drainage. It's still detention. It is still filtering before it goes out underneath the bridge on the other side. There's even infrastructure there. So... So again, if the, so. I went back there and I looked at it and I was surprised that it was a settling pond behind there because I didn't expect to see that when I went back there. So and, and, and what it does is the water running off the hill is caught there and it's supposed to settle there. But of course, with the amount of construction that we have going on, it probably isn't working the way that it's supposed to. But there's a whole, I actually thought the government is the one that did the drainage because right. I was back there. I, I had to go see things for myself. It's similar. Yeah, and there's one, there's one in Bodo too, um, that's yeah. set up the same way, and it's the same thing that we just did in Bolongo. So, the, all the water coming off the hill just goes straight into the sea. Instead, it goes into a, I don't know if you need to dig out more or whatever. It goes into a settling nice pond, function. and then the, the 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 sediment settles and the water could drain away. I mean, this is a standard practice we're using um, all over the island. I went and saw the one in Fortuna too. There's a big one down there um, that Eric Dem did. So again, the, 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 the goal of that project is to be a settling pond for the water to retain before it slowly filters out, making its natural progression out to sea. So understand, that's what we're talking about when the gentlemen were talking on this side too. They would have to build a settlement pond at some point on this side to stop this, the water from going in to the ocean. Not the water, the sediment from going into the ocean. That's the same thing they're going to do in Savan. That's the same thing they're going to do in Turpentine Run. Um, they have to create these settling ponds in order to stop the sediment right. from flowing freely into the bays. So, so again, for so to answer your question about yes, there was a permit that was issued. To answer your question about whether or not the plan was released to the public. Public hearings are required when it's determined to be a major CZM permit. That's where we do the whole public hearing and announcements and everything. When, I'm sorry, if you would like to answer the two questions. Can, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Can you allow him, can you allow him to answer the question? I mean, we could all be respectful to one another to get information. Yes. Yes, heavy equipment. No, a permit was allowed for there to be heavy equipment to come in to remove the dead, uh, the, the, the dead vegetation, right? Create the actual settling pond. So actually digging to a specific depth in order to get retention and then leaving in place all of the mangroves along the fringe before it settles out into the drainage channel. Yes. How long how is long the permitting the, process? The permitting process took about three to four months. No. No, that, that permit was issued in 2018. That permit was issued in 2018. He, he was in the commissioner in 2018. Uh, good evening. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge everyone that is here, and I just want to bring present all those that couldn't make it. I really appreciate you guys for showing up and being present in our community. Um, we've been anxious to talk to you guys for quite some time. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you for being here. You guys are a reflection of our concerns, and we are a reflection of what we can do for our communities. So thank you. Um, and then I also just want to put out there just three quick points. Um, for those that couldn't make it this evening, um, several of us put down on a piece of paper a lot of our thoughts and concerns that we have not been able to voice as yet. I'm going to be passing around a piece of paper here that has my email. 
we're going to be sending a follow-up second half of our list of concerns so that they have ample time to go over them and to really come back and so that we can strategize together a lot of our old concerns and a lot of new concerns that have been happening. So I'm just going to pass around that paper. It's going to be going around here in a second. Um, Thank you for that. Yep. Yeah, because um, we want this to be efficient and productive for you guys just as much as we need it to be for us. So uh, just a, a quick note for Public Works. Um, there are definitely roads of concern. We don't know which ones are government. We don't know which ones are private. So just a quick point of some of them that you, that you should be aware of that we're concerned about in our community is definitely Barrett Hill Road, Hall Bay Road, the Tutu Bay Road, Spring Road, the poles that have been removed, um, that have not yet been removed, those that have been replaced, um, the signage on our roads, and we definitely have issues with the, the scenic drive at the top of the road going to Dorothea area where there's the orange barrier, where there's been two accidents already. That is definitely of major concern to all of us. Um, and we are definitely concerned about the upkeep of our guts and the maintenance of the bush along the road. Okay, stop so, right there. That was Sorry. my first point. Wait. So I think this afternoon before I left the office, yes. I received an email from Ms. Bryn. Yes. Thank you. Yes, you're and I did. I did respond. Thank but you. we were already uh, in, the, in the process of coming here. Yeah, we've So that's allow me a little more time to respond to you properly with all the, you know, give you some type of timeline. Thank and you. I appreciate that. I did print out the email that I sent. So if yes. anybody wants to see the existing um, notes that we made, it'll be on that paper with my email. Yes. So, um, they, so everyone yeah. here today, they forwarded already. Thank you. So I will follow up with you sometime. Just give me awesome. a little chance to answer. Yeah, the I have it. Three pages. <laughs> What of stuff. So just yeah. give me a chance. <laughs> More coming tomorrow. Okay. Um, the second thing, just to make it really quick, um, as you know, Hall Bay is the ground center to our community. It is it is the heart and soul of our community life. It has been a place of commerce, yes, but it's also been a place where we live, and we have been experiencing all as well as environmental impacts. We've been experiencing nev negative cultural impacts to us with the recent developments. Just to bullet point, so that you are aware, this isn't a question, this is a comment. Please be aware, these are serious concerns that need to be addressed that our grandfathered in system is not keeping up with. Okay. I want to address that a little bit, and I probably yeah. should because it'll never be politically appropriate, you know? You know, I grew up in St. Thomas, and I used to run in the middle of the street barefoot up and down Savannah. He had no care. And they used to come out here and had bush. You go St. John, they had donkey. Mm -hmm. And now everybody come. We welcome everybody, and the development happened. We as Virgin Islanders have endured a lot over the years, and we, we see our places go. But this is America, and you know people are going to buy property. There's two things that we really need to do, is identify some pieces that we want to save and mm -hmm. buy them. So because economic power is economic power, and our Virgin Islanders sell to the people who come here to develop. So I think we need to decide what we want to keep, and then we need to start to buy those pieces of property. Because the laws are what the laws. I asked the commissioner, and I was shocked to find out, some of the things that go places, they just don't belong there, right? The way that the law is written, he cannot deny a permit as long as it is um, under the use of R2. That's why I keep telling you the destination. So even if he don't want that building there, he cannot deny the permit legally to build that building as long as it complies with R2 codes. That's a problem. We got to figure out as a community and stick to it. Not when only when we affect, when we affect it, but when it is one of us building to say, we don't want that there. That doesn't belong there. We don't care why zone, but we don't want that there. And I don't know how to do that. So in our communities, all of us are irritated by the neighbor who have got 20 cars that won't get rid of them. We're calling the government to pick them up. The guy that got 60 chickens, the other dude that got 40 dogs. But we as a community have to pass that set of ordinances that is going to dictate how we live. And once we pass them, we can't build six apartments in our house when it's only supposed to have one or two or none. And we have to comply with that. And what we have to decide that when, no matter who it is, we're willing to say you're wrong. 
Because now all we want to do is we call a radio and we call a senator and we call everybody to, to justify the wrong. So as a community, I think it's really incumbent upon us to decide what the rules are going to be and then stick to them. I really appreciate that. And a big part of it is changing gear when now we are in a world where we have to be resilient. Right. So we may need to re revisit some of the zoning because one of the issues uh, that does need to be addressed is that this is a flood zone. Uh, also, we need to be aware that these are our, our green spaces and our community spaces. And we do want our green spaces to stay green and our community community. And we are concerned about our government lands in this area. And we also just want to put out there that for our government lands that are adjacent, including the beachfront that will be lost to sea level rise, um, we want to make sure that your administration knows that we don't want to see it sold to an investor or to a banker or to anybody who wants to further develop the area in a negative way. And I'm not knocking development. You are in a community of business-minded people. We have built buildings, schools, villages, churches. We are, we are part of the economy. We, we do not have a problem with that. But we do need more resilient, regenerative approaches to our watershed management in our sensitive cultural spaces just as much as our environmental spaces. Agree. So. Agree. And then just to quickly wrap up, um, some other things that we want to put on your radar is, you've heard it already, the parking is a major concern because it's taken away our public access um, and it's made it privatized. So we do need a strategic approach with partnership. We, we love having corporate responsible partners um, and he has made some great improvements in some areas so we need to continue the conversation of how we can be smart going forward from here um, and then also the runoff to the bay we all need to do our part because we're all having negative impacts as well um, but we do need better planning with the increase in buildings, in homes, in Airbnbs, in traffic, we do really need to sit down and plan out our parking better than what it is right now. Um, and then just to wrap up real quick, uh, the mangrove is very important to us. As you've heard, we want to make sure that our, our runoff is being slowed down, whether it's from retention ponds or replanting mangroves. And uh, we would love to continue this conversation. So please do make, make opportunities more available for us to continue this. COVID Thank permitting. Yeah. COVID permitting. I mean, a, a lot of the stuff we wanted to do, but it's to get out here. Um, and thank you uh, for that. Uh, the, you know, it's hard to get out with a COVID. It's like I'm probably going to get an email or two about having this many people together in St. Thomas with 237 uh, cases. But I'll, I'll stand the risk. How long have we been here now? It feels like an hour. No, we don't have any more questions? I, I want to make sure we get... Um, I also have a statement. So I want to reiterate what was being said. I think we want to see the mangroves be replanted um, and restored to what it was, number one. Also, I want to go back to address the gut in Brad's view. Below the tot lot, there is an animal uh, farm area. What is being done to stop the runoff from, from the animals going into the gut, coming into the bay? Because every so often, we have an outbreak of staph infections here in the beach. And then in addition to that. It's also all of this. The, the, none of these houses around here connected to any public sewer. So all the, su all the septic tanks run off in the bay. Anytime you have heavy flood, that's the same thing in St. Croix. When you have this much construction, all these septic tanks, the water got to go somewhere. So The other I mean, issue, uh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. One of the other big issues that uh, for the local people too, um, people tend to think that Hull Bay is a dog beach, and it is not. And so what is DPNR doing to patrol the beach and control the dogs that are being brought to the beach? Because the... The people who bring them do not clean up behind of them, contributing to the staff that's being brought into the ocean as well. DP, DPNR have a responsibility. I don't. I don't think that DPNR's responsibility too. So I can address. 
so, so uh, thank you for the question. Uh, DPNR actually does not have any re regulatory responsibility over dogs on the beach. There is a law in the books that says that any dog in a public space can't must be on a leash, and that leash cannot be longer than six feet. Um, but it is not specific that there is no dogs allowed on the beach, or that DPNR and our enforcement officers are the actual regulatory. If you, okay. <laughs> so. Anyways, again, DPNR does not have the regulatory authority for dogs on the beach. We 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 having a good conversation, bro. You no need for that. I mean, you got, we got you got a concern. You're saying Megan's Bay is a privately not privately it's a publicly managed beach that is run by a board that have rules. A lot of our beach have rules where you can bring a dog on. That's a rule. What he's saying is there is no law that stops you from bringing a dog or a horse on a public beach. I explain, I, I explain that to you though. It's a, it's a managed, yeah, yeah. DP and I have a sign that say no dogs. We didn't say that. No, no, no. The, so all, the, all these homes here connected to the sewer system? But that's all I'm saying. Let it, Give this lady a, a break, please. Thank you. Sir, I'm speaking up now because I've had a problem that I watch all the time, um, and it gives me hope that you guys are talking the way you are and you have the projects going. So I'd like to give you another one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, he's right about the Brassview sewer plant. Um, it, it has, it, it's very undersized for what it was originally set up for. And too many things are connected, too many homes and too many places are connected to it, even some businesses. It's been a great polluter of a lot of this area for a long time, and I know we're talking about mud runoff, but I'm talking about sewage runoff. I have tried to get them to replace the pipe because it actually goes across my land by a grant. And they've gone there very inefficiently. Um, a bunch of people who really don't care, they've put all kinds of blue pipe out there to take the runoff and put it out to sea. The blue pipe is all over the bed of this um, bay here. It's, it's all broken up. It's in one of the highest areas of uh, wind and wave activity, so it's really, really hard to get this done right. It's got to be done professionally. Currently, and for the last probably five years, it's broken off at the beach line. Everything that comes out of that sewer plant circulates through this bay. It's the reason for the staff here. It's the reason that I am careful when I go to my property because it's, it's contaminated. And it's broken right at the shoreline. You can watch the sewage come out of gotcha. it. Gotcha. This is the first time I ever hear about a brass view sewage plant and a problem in this side. Of I've, I've been to Hull Bay, talked to people. You know, the usual stuff, this, I've never heard that before. So I'll, I'll definitely look into that. All right. I think we're done. <laughs> so, last question, last question. This gentleman is very eager. Okay. Uh oh, I can't see the lights in my eyes. I'm okay, sorry. Okay, good evening, Governor. Good um, evening. And everyone. Um, the last time you had the meeting up at the Dorotel Park lot, we had talked about reasonable individual insurance, health insurance. And we need some health insurance for us. I mean, this is ridiculous now. Hello. 
Good evening. Oh, thank you for the question. The availability of the individual health uh, product has been an issue for a very long time. And it was exacerbated by, made worse by the fact that we were not, as a territory, covered under the Obamacare, Affordable Care Act. What we've done is our insurance staff has gone, we, we joined up with the Caribbean Association of Insurance Regulators, and we've been presenting to some of the insurance companies in the Caribbean as well. Uh, it's a very relevant question because just tomo tomorrow, we're having a meeting with a new company who is interested in doing business in the territory, and they will be offering a health insurance product. So we're meeting with them, beginning to, uh, to share with them what we require uh, for licensing and to look at what the competitive, how we can be competitive, how we don't have health products that our people cannot afford. Uh, but we're very excited uh, because this will be the first time in quite a long time uh, that we've had a, a good opportunity to improve on, that, on, on those offerings. Um, individuals, and I just wanted to add, because whenever I come out to speak, I really want to support the people in my offices who do such good work. And one of the, the things that is really changing our health insurance climate here and what makes it attractive to companies like this one that is uh, ready pretty much to apply to do business is that we have just been, for the first time, accredited by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. So what that does is it says to the entire country that when businesses come here with regard to doing insurance, the staff that regulates them, reviews their records, reviews their financial, um, uh, an analy analyze their financial uh, positions, et cetera, that they have been trained and are on par with any staff throughout this country. And that will change the climate uh, with regard to insurance for time to come. So we'll be following up with you and with the community as soon as they're on board. We can't, we're the regulator, so we can recruit, but we can't treat them differently than any other company. Um, so we, we have to do that balance, but we are very excited about the possibility that we'll be announcing that in the future. Thank you. Time for one minute. Oh, you can't keep I, okay. I would just like to add to that too, though. Um, health insurance is expensive. I mean, for the last two years, we have seen increased premiums in the government. The government have, what, 9,000 people on our Cigna insurance plan? Family insurance, we'd have paid $20,000 a year. And we get 9,000 people. So when people come to me, they say, you know, they're paying, they're getting quoted 18, 19, 20,000. That's what we pay. What happened is that the government absorbs the majority of costs. We pay like 12, 13,000, and then the individual only pays about 6,000 towards their family plan. And that's why it seems like government health insurance is inexpensive, but it is very expensive to the government. We're spending like $170 million a year on health insurance for our employees. No, that's what I'm saying for individual. That's why, I mean, if when you get in a bulk and it's still 20,000, individual is there. We've also went in and we've, we've, uh, we've uh, created these things called associative health plans where you can join the Chamber of Commerce and other organizations and you get a group coverage under an organization. We worked on that and we've gotten through that. There's a company here called Elon that you might have seen there advertisement that's offering health insurance packages, different levels for different people. Thank you, Gov. And I just wanted to add that I made reference when I opened to the, the variety of functions that we perform at the Office of the Lieutenant Governor. And one of the things I want to make sure that people are aware of is that we have a complaint hearing officer process that if anybody has any issue, either with the property, casualty, or health insurance, we advise you to please write to us. You can initiate a complaint. We can have a hearing with regard to your issue, and we can order whether it is a bank or an insurance company uh, to deliver a particular uh, course of action. So I just want to let, to let you know that we have that advocacy function as well. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I would really like to know if uh, the rumors that I've heard about developing Neltyberg Bay with the cruise ship companies has any merit or not. 
No merit. No merit. At least not that I know of. Nelty Bug, there's no no conversations about Nelty Bug and cruise ship development. Okay, thank you. As as far as I know. Wait, no one has approached me. We don't have to that. revisit this. There are a lot of there are a lot of private development going on that the government doesn't necessarily know un- until they p- apply for a permit or somebody's attorney bring them to speak to me. You want me close? I thought you said a lieutenant governor and close. Yeah, yeah. I go, I mean I I was you you want you want to say something or you want to let me be? Okay. Thank you, um, everybody. Thank you. I really. Um, I really love y'all. I love my Virgin Islanders, so I love coming out and speak to you. And I'm really happy tonight with the discourse we had. You know why? Because the problems that I came here and talked about to people three years ago, we working on those, like the boat ramp they told me, the parking they told me, they told me about the paving, we working on that. We still got some work to do on the street lights. The drainage is still a problem. We got to work on that too. It's been three years, and I... And I've delivered on or started to deliver on the things that I told you want to do. Tonight, you give me some new problems, as would be expected. So we're going to have to work on those as well. I just want to thank you for being so committed to our Virgin Islands and taking time out of your night to come here and talk with us. I think we had a really respectful conversation both ways. I always give people my email, albert, albert.brian at vi.gov. My name, albert.brian at vi.gov. People email me. I read all my email. If you have a question or concern, I'm happy to answer them. Give me a day or two because I'm a little busy. But I try to get them back to you. Thank you all, and good night. Love you.